Um, let's see. Got it. Good morning and uh, welcome to this seminar on the value of home. I'm Carol Gregg, the pastor of the congregation at Duke Chapel. We welcome you to this winter seminar, which is sponsored by Community Ministry at Duke Chapel and the congregation at Duke Chapel. And I'm grateful that each of you has chosen to spend time this morning engaged in the topic of the value of home. We know the issue of housing is a live one in Durham with unsheltered neighbors, gentrification, the lack of affordable housing and rising home prices. Today's seminar will include opening devotions, presentations to the whole group, small group discussions, and closing devotions. I hope you will prayerfully and thoughtfully engage the material um, and engage with one another. Today's session is being recorded and will be posted to the congregation's YouTube channel. The breakout sessions will not be recorded. Um, it's being, re being recorded in speaker view so that most participants will not be visible. Nonetheless, you are welcome to turn off your camera if you prefer not to be seen. I invite you now to use the chat function to introduce yourself to others. Um, if you would give your name, uh, your church affiliation, if any, and connections that you already have to the issue of housing. For instance, if through volunteer work or employment, you're engaged with um, issues of housing. Go ahead and put that in the chat now and um, meet each other that way. I invite you during this seminar to keep your microphone muted so that we can all focus our attention on the presentations. Uh, when we are in the small group or it's time for Q&A, then please unmute yourself and speak as you wish. Um, also, as a reminder, in the upper right-hand corner of your screen, you will see a box in which you can change the view of your screen. I, re I recommend that you change it to speaker view for the presentation so that you can focus on the speaker and to change it to gallery view during the breakout groups. Carl Holloman, Brianne Van Belzen, and I are providing tech support today. If you have any questions, feel free to send one of us a private message by chat. So with that introduction, Dave Voss will now lead us in opening devotions, and he will be followed by Brianne Van Belsen, who will introduce our speaker. Good morning. Before I forget, or lest I forget, I just want to show you the picture that's behind me because it reminds me uh, we need to remember to thank God for a new day. Uh, that was taken up in the, in the Blue Ridge. Yeah, housing. Uh, Tough, tough topic, persistent, and especially so in Durham, but it is possible to make a difference. Uh, right now in our living room, we have uh, the efforts of our congregation with um, welcome home boxes for incarcerated members of neighbors in Durham who are coming uh, back out home. And uh, we've got a habitat program going, but uh, it's, it's a really uh, tough system, systemic thing. In the Bible, of course, uh, homes and homelessness are certainly treated. We've got, uh, uh, starting out with Adam, I guess, he got plunked into a home. He would have been homeless without the Garden of Eden, but Abraham called out, and of course, the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness, and again, homeless in Babylon, and uh, even the new church had no homes. They had to meet in various houses, and of course, Jesus had no place to lay his head. But um, for our devotional passage, I decided to tackle a, a verse that's uh, about as hard as uh, the intractable problem of, uh, of housing people. And that is Matthew 1, verse, uh, 7, verse 1. Judge not that you be not judged. Why? Well, when I think of housing, um, I have to talk to myself because when I see somebody homeless on the corner, I question their decisions. And um, then I realize, well, I haven't always made good decisions myself and, and so on, but uh, that is an area of judging. Or I'll see a uh, drive through a neighborhood and I'll see living in, people living in palaces. And I think surely there are more socially beneficial ways to, to uh, Park your money. 
And, uh, and so I find myself uh, judging in the sense of condemning sometimes. Of course, judging in the sense of discerning is blessed and encouraged in the Bible. But uh, I think uh, it is a tough verse to put into practice as the, syst- the um, situation of housing is, is difficult. Some of the people who are homeless, of course, can teach us a lot, uh, study the culture of poverty and, and realize that the people on the street really do have a lot of smarts um, in how to survive. They could probably teach us a thing or two. So with that, let's open with a word of prayer. Dear God, we want to come to you today asking for help. We praise you for this new day and for a chance to chat together and think on uh, these things. We pray especially for Terry that he could uh, lead us and have clear thoughts for us. We pray for uh, the city of Durham and leaders. And we also pray especially for the residents in uh, the Pugel Housing Project that are going to definitely undergo a lot of inconvenience and challenges in the next while as that uh, project is rehabbed or destroyed. We ask a blessing on this discussion today, and we thank you for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Dave. I am absolutely delighted to welcome uh, Terry Alaba as our speaker today. Um, and according to the Sanford School of Policy, Terry Alaba is a well-respected professor of the practice with over 30 years of experience as a local state and national leader on policy and practice around ending homelessness and developing affordable housing. He's chosen to do that uh, oftentimes in Durham as serving uh, as a longtime executive director for Housing for New Hope, which provides homeless prevention, street outreach services, rental assistance, and permanent supportive housing for those experiencing homelessness. He's been a frequent presenter at national and state conferences on subjects including affordable and permanent supportive housing, homeless vets, and advocacy. He served in founding and leadership roles in multiple nonprofits, including uh, the Durham Affordable Housing um, and Transit Coalition, Council to End Homelessness in Durham, and the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness. In addition, he's had numerous stints at a state as, as a state captain for North Carolina advocacy delegations to Capitol Hill in Washington, DC. And he's recently completed a five-year tenure as the state coordinator for ending veteran homelessness, working for both the North Carolina Department of Military and Veteran Affairs and the North Carolina Coalition to End Homelessness. Currently, Terry serves as community advocate on homeless and housing issues in Durham and as an adjunct instructor of housing policy and implementation at the Sanford School of Public Policy here at Duke. Last but not least, I know Terry, not only as all of these things and have witnessed uh, much of his very effective work here in Durham, um, I know him as a humble, knowledgeable and wise friend and colleague who has always had a kind word and a calming presence. He listens deeply and with compassion. And I hope as he shares his wisdom with us today, we too will listen deeply and with compassion for our neighbors. So thank you, Terry, for joining us today and for leading this seminar. We're we're pretty excited you're here. Wow, Bree, thank you so much. Uh, I hope I can live up to at least some of those wonderful words you've said about me. And and it's it's also my great joy to get to work with you in Durham. And uh, and Carol, I appreciate so much the invite from you and the congregation at Duke to share with you some of my working knowledge around affordable housing and hopefully to share with you some of my passion for the work and why I think it's so important, has been and continues to be in the, the, the life of our, uh, of, our, of our United States and our world and, and specifically here in Durham. So I have a, a PowerPoint that I'm gonna bring up here shortly and maybe I'll just do that now that I'll be sharing with you. All right. 
So what I want to do, as, as Carol said, we'll have a variety of ways to interact, both uh, some presentation, as well as some breakout sessions, as well as some processing in, in our larger group. Um, uh, the, the first part of what I want to do actually is an exercise, and it has to do with the title that I gave this uh, presentation, The Value of Home. Uh, and home is a powerful, it, the word itself is evocative, uh, whether it's on a psychological or spiritual, even physical plane, home, as soon as we say the word, it resonates with, within us. And we have lots of sayings that have developed through the years that, that uh, denote that almost, uh, sometimes almost magical, uh, but deep-rooted feeling. There's no place like home. Uh, baseball, you have to leave home and come back to home. That's the, that's the purpose of the game. Uh, so there's just these rich ways uh, that home and house and home have shaped us. So for this first piece this morning, I want us to think about your home, where you either where you grew up or where you're living now. Uh, whatever place, when I say home, whatever images come to mind. And I want you to think about and, and, and share, we're gonna go into a breakout session and talk and take turns talking about the places where you spent time. Uh, where, where was the family center? Was it, did you spend time in the kitchen? Was your bedroom a, a special place for you? Was outside or perhaps a living room or, or, or some other spot? And, and what we're after is not only, I want you to describe it. Uh, and, and again, this is not to cause any uh, guilt if you grew up in a great big old place or if you grew up in something much more a shame because you, maybe your beginnings were more humble. This is just to get at this value of home. What is it, what is it as you're describing that made or makes home? Uh, we're gonna spend about uh, six minutes, uh, Bree, in this breakout session, and we're gonna do pairs. So you have three minutes each way, and then we'll come back and we'll have an opportunity to share some of those kind of key phrases and words that, that come up for you. So uh, is the assignment clear? Somebody give me a nod. Okay. So Bree, if you will uh, assign the breakout rooms and we'll see you in a few minutes. Okay, I uh, want to welcome everybody back um, uh, to their session and like to invite people just kind of popcorn style to share, you know, a short either phrase or sentence uh, that came up for you as you did this exercise and, and uh, Bree's going to help us kind of capture that. Um, so, uh, who would like to start and I guess, uh, maybe raise your hand using a function, if you will, I'd be the best way, or just jump out there. Go ahead, Carol, unmute and talk. You remember, you have to unmute yourself to, to do this. You're still muted, there you go. Um, for, uh, for us, it's a, for me, it's a gathering spot. It's the room where we gather with family. Ah, okay. Someone else, just keep going. Unmute and go. Sanctuary. A sanctuary. Was that your your whole home or a particular place in the home that was especially true for you, Terry? Oh, probably more kitchen than anywhere else. Ah, okay. Sanctuary of the kitchen. Good. Keep going. Uh, Brianna and I talked about hospitality, which is rather like the gathering spot, but it's more the idea of bringing people in, um, you know, and, and kind of making family. Ah, very good. Hospitality and gathering round. Keep popping out here. We need some more. A place where um, they actually, we put a lot of sweat equity in and uh, ah. built and uh, finished off a lot of the stuff, even though we don't have many skills. <laughs> very um, good. So a lot of, you know, investment in it that way. Yes, I like that investment, sweat equity investment, a wonderful thing that makes a, creates a sense of your home, your home. 
I mentioned that I had never included my garden in my home, and now it feels as an extension of the interior home. So garden, so it's outside space is also mm -hmm. your home. And that's and correct. How you value that. Let's get a couple more. One or two more. I'll mute yourself and share with us. I think the, the concept of security came up in several ways mm -hmm. uh, in terms of a place where uh, certainly as a child, um, you know, you, you felt familiar and um, a place where you could relax. Uh huh. Very good. Very good. One or two more. Well, I'll say I'll say for me, it was uh, what was consistent was a, a place to read and study. Uh, it was encouraged. I actually, sometimes like to go to bed early when I was a child so I could read longer. Um, and that was it, it was just a place where uh, I was encouraged to do that. I was encouraged to be well read. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to add, Terry, but then I thought it would, I maybe would be too weird that for me, it's a workplace, mm. not, and not, not only, not only during the pandemic, but especially during the pandemic, it's, it's a place where the work of my life happens and, and that takes shape in many ways. Um, sure. And without it, where would I work, right? Where would my work take place? Mm hmm so as we will, anybody else got a last minute thing they'd like to add? I was just going to say, I also noted that um, the gathering space or my, the homes I've been in have been physically comfortable and in an environment that's safe. And so I didn't have to worry about, um, it, was, it was secure in a practical sense as well. And so um, for those who don't have that kind of, um, physical comfort or physical security, I wondered if it was different. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Thanks for that from all of you. And thanks for that ending query there, Carol. As we look at the list, what is home for you? You know, gathering spot. It's a place that's comfortable. It's sanctuary. It provides security and safety. Uh, it can provide a place for us to do our work. Uh, it's a place of hospitality, of gathering, of being around a table, of, of having food together, of, of both family and community. It's a place where you can invest some of your own skills and energy into making it your home, sweat equity. It's, it has outside space, a, a garden that you're nourishing and in terms is, and, and is giving back to you. Uh, it's, it's a place to read and study and to have uh, alone time. It's, it's, a, it, it's a place that, and you put all this together and this, this brings a vitality uh, to our experience of home. And as we go into this conversation about affordable housing, about the challenges that face the poor and the housing insecure, they, the, the, the point of contact here is they want the self same thing. They want these very same things. They hunger and yearn for these. But when you're in a life situation where you're not earning enough money or you're paying too much of your income towards your rent, you can bet that some of these items, including health, they're going to suffer and they're going to be less. So, so for me, uh, one of the important uh, steps into affordable housing and, and developing a relationship, not only with the issue with the people, is to understand why this matters. You know, this is why it matters. If we are experiencing having these kinds of experiences at home, don't we yearn for that, uh, to Carol's remark, don't we yearn to that for others? 
And, and for me, that is what has spurred my work. It's, it's coming to understand the, even though we ha I had some times of housing insecurity when I was young, uh, uh, nevertheless, I also had so many times of, of really feeling nourished by it. And, and so the motivation is to, well, what, what happens if we have more and more members of our community who are housing secure, who are paying a, a fair share of their income for rent, who can have access to these kind of grounding uh, particulars. So you can take that down now. We'll put back up the slide. Thank you all for doing that. We might come back later in the presentation uh, to explore it. So as I, at the first part of this, I want to look at some of the nuts and bolts of a, a housing affordability and policy. Um, and the underlying question is this right here, is housing a right or a privilege? Uh, in a document I'm going to reference here in a little bit called Out of Reach, which is produced by the, the National Low Income Housing Coalition on the status of housing across the country. Uh, that stated in their, in their last publication, housing is a basic human need that should be regarded as an unconditional human right. And how a, a, a nation and states and communities answer this question, not only the, the broad question of it, but how the nuanced question of it is what undergirds what your affordable housing policy is. Uh, is it a right or is it a privilege? And, and uh, we'll keep that in mind as we're moving through some of this more um, uh, sort of housing 101. I wanna, I wanna make sure that we're comfortable with some, with some terms. And so I'm gonna spend about 10, 15, 20 minutes here or so uh, going over some of these basic terms uh, of what we mean. And we, we read affordable housing is said a lot. Well, what does it mean? Well, for me, uh, not for the whole community, what I would like <laughs> is that it, it, uh, it, it denotes rental units at or below 60% of the area median income. And the rent for this particular group of households of people is set in such a, 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 at such a rate that a household does not pay over 30% of their income for rent. Now, 80% and below is often used. And in some of the, uh, some of the literature we're gonna, can you make, how do I make my uh, screen a little bigger on the PowerPoint, Bree? There we go, thanks. Um, oh, I lost control of it. Terry, you weren't actually sharing your screen, so I just started sharing. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, well, let I me can stop sharing on. and you can share if you want. Okay, yeah, let me just share again. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So sometimes uh, 80% and below- Terry we're, Terry, we're not seeing your PowerPoint. We're seeing a oh. uh, uh, list of your files. Oh, okay. At least I am. Okay. Yeah, yeah. no, I am as well. All right. Let's try this again. Are we back on now? Okay. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. So 80% uh, is often used. And, and the thing to be aware of that sometimes affordable housing is just used as a contextual term. It can mean anything. It can mean that in a, in a neighborhood where houses sell for half a million dollars, 400,000 would be affordable. And, and a lot of time realtors will, will use that. So you have to be careful of what you read when it refers to affordable housing. And so even though the, the, the uh, affordability rate is set at 30% of one's income in order to be considered affordable housing, 
However, many, many households pay higher than that uh, percentage. And matter of fact, the higher percentage they pay for their income, the more cost burden they are and the more likelihood that some other uh, uh, element of their life, whether it's healthcare or clothing or food is going to be lacking. Let's see, how come I can no longer, there we go, okay. So another term, and I'm gonna put these terms together here shortly is area median income. It's very simply the midpoint of income distribution across a community. Half the families in, in whatever defined region that is are more and half of them are less. And in terms of housing policy, it's often set uh, to target and to uh, serve people at various levels of the median income. Uh, for example, 50% uh, is identified to, to, uh, to uh, households that would be eligible for what's called housing choice vouchers, historically known as Section 8. These are rental vouchers uh, issued by the Durham Housing Authority locally that help make up the difference uh, so that a family who's living at least 50% or less uh, can afford the available housing. So, so you have, you have um, as we look at these income limits, uh, they, they sign various percentage levels of that area median income. So our statistical reporting area for this, you see is Durham Chapel Hill. So it's more than just Durham. And so within that, within that whole area, obviously there are a lot of um, uh, levels of income, uh, but it takes into account the whole group. So for that area, and again, policy is set around using this data, the median income for us is $86,400. And so there are limits then to look at who, what size households here, whether it's one, two, three, four, how many people in the family, and are they living at or below 50% of the median income? And it gives you the rates for that. So example, family of four wants to, uh, needs a housing choice voucher because they cannot afford uh, to pay their rent. Um, they have to make this amount here or less in order to qualify, 43,200. And you see, and, and that's called very low income is 50%, extremely low income. They don't have the figure here, but it actually refers to 30% and below. And as I talk about some of the developments in Durham, uh, there, there's some projects that are targeting, targeting folks that are living 30% and below, as well as 50% and below, and 80% and below, all in one place. So you can see that, that in this uh, uh, chart, uh, it lists those various levels so that you have a sense about who you're talking about and what are those income limits in order to qualify for federal support or to live in certain targeted housing for affordable housing. So another piece here, I'm going through this quickly, but hopefully the, these terms are at least maybe familiar to you and I, and I won't go too quickly that you don't see how they all put together. So there is something called the fair market rate. And fair market rate is determined by landlord. It looks at the statistical reporting areas to see what, and it's roughly the average, not, but it's not average. It's, it's, it takes into account some different factors. And this is the rate that's established by HUD that says the, the maximum rate that HUD will provide a housing voucher for to help pay for. Now, keep in mind, this is not dictating what people have to charge. Uh, in the market, market in, or whatever the owner wants to say, if I, if I want to build units and charge $2,000 uh, a month rent and there are people that pay that, that's my right. As a matter of fact, there have been certain, uh, I, I will say that, that that right is really protected, especially in North Carolina. There's a real reluctance to put any kind of rent controls or what's called inclusionary zoning. And I'll explain that in a little bit, I don't want to get too sidetracked here, but um, there's a resistance to tell a private owner what he or she can do with their property. If I can build it, if I own it and I build it, uh, I can charge what I want if people will pay it. The market, the market dictates that. This fair market rate though is established by HUD to ensure that, to set guidelines 
for what can be charged to the government to help support people in housing. So as you go to the bottom here, you see the FMR, uh, fair market rate for Durham, for, uh, where again, this is Durham and Chapel Hill, our statistical reporting area. So you can see right here from a two bedroom from, from 2020 to 2021 increased, uh, what is that? 34, 12, uh, 40, about $46 a month increase over a year. So that, that means, for example, if I am searching for housing and I have a voucher, the maximum I could, uh, that could be charged to me in 2021 here would be $1,134. So that gives you a sense then of both uh, income brackets, fair market rates. And so th these are the mechanics of how affordable housing and accessing affordable housing for, for people, households living at and below 80% of the area median income. And I'm gonna go through this and then I'm gonna pause and after a couple more slides and, and take some questions. And I, I, I don't want us to dive too much into the depth here, but I think it's important that as we talk about affordable housing, you have this overview, you have some basic, uh, make sure you've got the, some of the basic concepts down. So this is out of the document out of reach that I mentioned, and they publish it every year and they, they show each state and then they break down uh, each state into these uh, categories. So you can see that for 2021, uh, the fair market rent in North Carolina is 960, which is about uh, 100, well, oh, not quite 200, about $150 uh, less than Durham's rate. They look at see what uh, a person working at minimum wage uh, would have to work, you see on the far right over here, would have to work 86 hours a week in order to form a one bedroom rental house at, at the fair market rate that we just defined. Uh, they, they, what they present here something that I, I want you all to see called the average renter wage. And this is what a worker would need to make in order to afford uh, a two bedroom apartment at market rate, 1637. And you can see down here, they have the most expensive areas and Durham Chapel Hill makes it in at 2181 as one of the most expensive markets in the state for how much wages are needed to afford the housing. But we're far below Asheville. I mean, in my work across the state, everybody, every community told me we have the, high, we have the highest rate of housing here. We have, the, we have the hardest to access. And in terms of data, in terms of uh, Asheville is, is, has the highest cost of housing. So this is something that you can uh, refer to. I, it's in, I think uh, Brianna or, or Carol are gonna share the slides afterwards and it's a good reference point, uh, I think for, for us. So big question is who we're talking about here, right? Who are these, who are these folks that need affordable housing? Well, this comes uh, from wage estimates uh, that are done a fast food worker in this in this area. Uh, an average is about $23,280, 27% of that area median income. Firefighter, 40% of AMI. Carpenter, 47%. Teacher, and I think this was a teacher with six years, high school, I, I forget exactly how that broke down, but it looked at sort of the aggregate and the average, 57% of AMI. So all of these uh, folks in these categories are not going to be earning sufficient funds where they can afford most of the housing, the vast majority of the housing that's available and not pay more than 30% of their, of, of their income toward rent. Um, so what this creates, a couple more slides and then I'll pause. Uh, what this creates is an affordability gap. And this economy, what we're trying to do is we're trying to feed activity that brings the cost of housing down and brings uh, potential tenants income up. So on the top side, you have things like tax credits that are credits uh, given to investors that they can claim over a 10 year period that helps finance uh, affordable housing development. Grants, low interest loans, the donation of public land, a big, big, big piece in the affordable housing development conversation. 
density bonuses where developers, if they will agree to provide uh, uh, additional uh, units at an affordable rate, are allowed to be build more units per per uh, per acre. Um, and then there's materials and production methods, things that reduce those housing costs. And at the same time, just doing that won't work. You also have to bring up uh, wages from employment. You have to, living wages are so important to make this economy of affordability work. Uh, this would include also rental subsidy, uh, such as the vouchers that I've already mentioned, as well as what we're reading about more and more, which is shared living, not, not just among those needing affordable housing, but those who are, there was just an article in the paper this morning about elderly who are seeking that out because they, they used to seek it out for, to relieve isolation. And now they're seeking it out because they can't afford to stay in their place. They can't afford the cost to that place. And so the last slide, this next to last slide for this section are interventions that we did to increase that affordability gap. So you bring uh, what is available to folks on the income side closer up to what the, 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 the rental price is. And so the more, just to say for a developer, those, those things I mentioned in the previous slide, those uh, uh, investments, those interventions are what enable a developer to charge less rent because you have to earn enough income from your rents in order to sustain the business. Uh, um, and so investments from the uh, uh, supply side are very important in order to allow an operator to actually be able to charge affordable rents and still stay in business. So this last piece is, is a kind of dense sort of uh, document uh, before we pa pause. And here I wanted to say that uh, these kind of define on the left-hand side, the different intervention types that are working to decrease that affordability gap. And some of them I've already mentioned, the demand side, that's very much the vouchers. The supply side, that just, you see the on right here on the, under the examples, you see the low income housing tax credits, the housing trust fund, property tax abatements. Right now in Durham, if you have, there's uh, both the city and county offer a property tax abatement to households 80% and below the area median, in, in, median income who have lived in their house uh, for over 10 years. And the city will pay half of your property tax up to $750 a city and county. So that's not a, that's, that's one small tool, but it's an important tool. So it's not like you have the one thing that's going to make affordable housing happen. You have to have a whole menu of interventions in order to make progress. Uh, you can see some incentive-based regulations. I mentioned inclusionary zoning, which is law that says when you build multifamily units or do developments, you have to include a certain percentage that qualifies affordable housing. Many states and cities have this as a law, which that means you can require builders to do that. North Carolina does not. Matter of fact, they actively resist it. There has been some uh, inclusionary zoning in Chapel Hill. And there's been talk, and, and they did it despite the rule. Uh, they did it mostly around uh, home ownership. And Durham has had conversation about that, but there's great reluctance from Durham to, quote, take on the state uh, about this. Uh, and, and probably that won't happen until there's a significant change in the legislature that would, that would uh, uh, support such a, uh, a move. Uh, you have, uh, in, you know, enforcement based, these are zoning regulations, you have where there's been violations of either uh, discrimination um, and, and, the, and the Justice Department requires uh, cities or states to come into a compliance. And then you have the deregulation, which includes uh, uh, the density bonus that I mentioned, as well as reduced parking lot uh, requirements. This is a big one for affordable housing. Um, it's often required that uh, when you're building um, multifamily developments that it was often two, two parking lots per household, but then you have some units that are being built uh, and that's very expensive. And so there has been work uh, with affordable housing, get that reduced Willard Street, uh, an 82 unit apartment uh, facility for that's affordable housing downtown was able to get that reduced. I, I think it was like point 
seven or 0.6, somewhere in there, which greatly reduced their cost. So again, you're up on that top end side of housing cost, which enables them to better operate because they didn't have that huge debt that came off uh, if they would have met the parking requirement. So with that, I wanna pause and, and see if you all have some comments or questions at this point. Was it clear <laughs> or was so it just much. like, what in the world are you talking about? <laughs> it's just so much to, to absorb. But, but Terry, I'm wondering if you could say a little more about what Chapel Hill has done and Durham hasn't and sort of the importance of that issue. Well, they, they, they did some uh, required a developer, some developers when they were doing home ownership uh, to, to build in a certain a percentage of affordable units. And, and so in a sense, it was required. And the, the sense has been other localities have been reluctant to do that, especially Durham, because as soon as Durham would do that in defiance of the, of the law, what it is, it's the, the resistance against rent control. Anything that's about limiting the right, as I said at the beginning, is it a right or a privilege? Uh, the, in, in, in this case, arguing that's the right of a person charge whatever they can. So um, they have done that, but they've done it quietly and sort of under the, I, I guess, under the wire, so to speak. Um, but other communities know this and Charlotte, et cetera, they're, they're not willing to take that on. It could be very costly. So uh, the, the, the most of the work around that is advocacy around getting people in that that understand more of, uh, who are coming from more of a viewpoint of housing as a right rather than a privilege, right? the bottom line. Great, great. Other comments, questions? Where are the bottle, where are the bottlenecks? Um, you know, supply side and, and uh, demand side. Yeah. Obviously it's an economy of scarcity. What are the chief bottlenecks that we should be on the phone to our senators and reps? Yeah, want? well, the, the, the land is the big one in Durham, available land. Uh, in some of the examples I'm going to point out in the next section, uh, they are based on use of public land. That's why I said I really highlighted that uh, because here's the deal with public land is that even though you can't require a developer to do so many affordable housing units, you can, if you own the land as the government, uh, you can say we're only receiving requests for development if it includes this amount or this amount of affordable housing. And that's within your legal rights. So therefore publicly owned land is actually, it's the people's land, right? And so identifying that land that can be used is critical uh, to this development. Another piece I would say that uh, uh, is that uh, what's happening, and I, and I think this was noted in maybe some of the stuff Carol sent out originally, is that it's increasingly uh, becoming true that less and less landlords and property managers will receive uh, vouchers from, from the Durham Housing Authority. Um, there was a, a work a few years ago, probably about 10, by uh, Legal Aid Group in, in uh, the Justice Center, uh, in, in Raleigh to introduce legislation into the North Carolina legislature that would add source of income as a protected right, just as uh, it, you can't discriminate against someone because of their race, their gender, their age, their family status. This is protected by fair housing laws. And the argument was that it should be the same uh, for your source of income. Why, if I have a voucher, why is my voucher not as good as my bank account? I mean, the government is guaranteeing payment. That should be a protected right. I think that that is one of the things that is, is one of the biggest stumbling blocks. And that, again, we go back to this housing as a right, housing as a privilege, um, that, that it, uh, it, it's not about housing developments, it's, it's way of using the private market uh, in order to access uh, needed affordable housing. So those, those are a couple that come to mind right off the top, Dave, thank you. Terry, maybe you'll talk about this later, but the um, bond uh, issue for affordable housing that the community passed a couple of years ago, 
how does that play into all this? I, I am going to go into detail on that in our next session. Carol, you're anticipating. That's good. You know, you, you kind of get a sense about where I'm headed. <laughs> Any other comments or questions about this first part? Um, I'll ask a question, Terry. Can, can the city or county commissioners or whatever, whatever their titles are, can they, if, if they have the political and moral will to decide that they would not um, would not tolerate development that does didn't take these considerations into take these data points and and metrics into consideration. Could they do that, or are they what? constrained by state or federal laws that and and the, those state and federal laws around property rights? Are they re are their hands really tied to to if, if, if to, to, to deny a property owner who you knows money is coming from Utah or Russia to develop another expensive and ugly apartment building in and around downtown Durham? If they wanted to say no, can they say no? The the they can't say no based on uh, calling for inclusionary zoning or telling a private developer that they have to create so much affordable housing. The entry points for conversation are, as you'll hear in one example in the next section, uh, are that a developer wants a zoning change or wants some sort of regulatory uh, change and anything that pitches that into the public comment um, and decision can impact, uh, but they cannot just say no. And so what you have, what you have happening in Durham to a large degree is trying to use uh, either the, the, the mayor's bully pulpit or the influenced uh, an encouragement to be a good citizen. <laughs> uh, this came up very much in the Northgate Mall redevelopment conversation where the community wanted to see affordable housing and the owner says, no, I, you know, we're, we'll do some things, but we're not going to do much. And we don't have to because they're not, they don't need anything right now from the city. So anytime you're asking either for a city change, a variance, uh, a, a zoning change, money, those kinds of things give you some control then in the public process on whether, on whether that's allowed. But, but they are small compared to the rights of a uh, developer who owns the property outright, it's zoned correctly, uh, that they necessarily accept by persuasion have to do anything. So that's, that's, that's where we are. Yeah. Fortunately, our, I, in the other part of your question is that we do have city council members and county commissioners that very much do take into account the metrics of that. So what we're seeing and that will be a good transition, I think, to our next part is a public initiative around affordable housing. And that's one of the things I want to share with you all. Uh, Carol, it's right at 11. I had built in for a break. Do we need a break? Uh, you know, two minute stretch break or, or what would you suggest? I, I think maximum of two minutes, but yes, a stretch. is Okay, a two minute stretch it. break and see y'all back here in two minutes. That's you got to move quickly. It's a short, a short session though, two hours goes fast. <laughs> With so much material to cover. Indeed. Okay, people can hear me and can you see the slide? Okay, yes, all good to go on that front. Okay, so I'm going to move into the second part, which uh, looks a more, a little bit more at Durham specifically. Uh, we've already mentioned Durham, and really, to to best understand our situation, I think it's helpful to see what we are facing as a three pronged um, crises, a three pronged pandemic. Even there's the ongoing reality of COVID-19. 
which has become COVID-20, COVID-21, COVID-22. It's morphing and morphing and morphing, and we don't know how long, really, we're going to live with this reality. Uh, there's a crisis that existed before uh, the, pan the COVID pandemic, which is the lack of affordable housing and lack of units, and especially what's happening in Durham is displacement due to gentrification. And then there's three, there's the enduring legacy of racism that has impacted uh, policy around housing since we had policy around housing beginning shortly after during the depression years and shortly before World War II. And uh, so I'm gonna talk for a while, uh, briefly, I guess, about each of these uh, crises. Um, the, the, the poor experienced and the frontline workers experienced the brunt of COVID. It was hard to, uh, if you were living in a doubled up house, if you're living in any kind of crowded living situations to be able to practice a good distancing, masking, et cetera, in the home. So, and one of the things that our home security that we mentioned in our first exercise gave us was some shields not only against COVID, though none of us are fully protected and not sure uh, I, among others, have actually had COVID, um, but it did provide us a place to recover. Uh, you can imagine what this, if you don't know specifically what challenge this brought, for example, the homeless response system. Well, where you have primarily congregate shelters, which was the breeding ground for COVID to spread in order to try to allay that uh, for example, urban ministries of Durham uh, using federal money um, that was provided during COVID uh, moved out their operations out to the Sheraton Inn. And in addition to that, a, uh, uh, housing was leased and it still is at the Duke Carolina Inn on Guest Road for uh, people experiencing homelessness who uh, were most uh, vulnerable, had the most risky conditions that they might contract it. Um, and of course, even with these precautions, there, was, there, there were a lot of people prevented, but we still had outbreaks. We had outbreaks at the, both the Durham Rescue Mission and the Urban Ministries of Durham Shelter. Uh, and that was the reality, especially of congregate uh, living. We did have, as you may recall, a, a moratorium is, issued by the CDC uh, on evictions. And so eviction rates, went down uh, and have been down for about the last year and a half. And now as that moratorium has been lifted, we're starting to see more filings uh, in the courts uh, for eviction. There has been money uh, 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 through the American Rescue Plan Act that's been used to help uh, uh, provide rental subsidy and rental payments um, to folks that are, uh, can't pay their rent in Durham. Uh, there's a second massive amount of money that is coming to our, our city again, the first, the, it, but it's been fraught with trouble trying to get that money out and meet all the qualifications both that the federal government had and that the local governments added to it. There was a, there was a problem with cash flow. There was also a reluctance of landlords at times to say, I'm, I'm not, I won't take. It goes back to this uh, uh, issue that I talked about with vouchers. I'm not willing to take the go you, your government money in order to pay your back rent. I mean, it seemed foolish, but there are a number of, and uh, there's some large landlords that, re that refuse to do that. Um, it, it did uh, 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 call for a change. And in this new round of money there, there are actually times that money will be paid directly to the tenant. So the tenant can pay the money to the landlord. This, and I tell you what, this is a big change in policy because our federal policy, our local, our state policy has never trusted poor people, giving poor people money because they'll be foolish with it and they'll spend it on things that aren't needed. I mean, that's the basic, um, uh, goes back to this housing is right or privilege. That's the basic understanding because we've been in a pandemic, it's forced this issue where you have landlords not accepting. So that's been a change and we'll see how that's going to play out, how that impacts, what, it, what will impact uh, future policy. And I'll stop my share here briefly. So one 
one book that really captures the, the, the whole culture of eviction is this here. It's, it's Evicted. It's by Matthew Desmond. And it follows, he lived in communities in Milwaukee during the, the late, uh, like 2007, 2008. And he tells their stories. It's told in story form. Uh, and then all the public policy and data is in the footnotes. So it reads very well and you get, you get involved. And what he depicts is this, the, 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 the whole system of eviction that it's not, it's not just simply the result of poverty, but the eviction itself causes poverty. And the more people are evicted, the, the, the farther and farther they fall and, and to despair and to economic despair, as well as psychological despair, and just the huge human toll that the whole eviction process uh, takes on. So one of the things he argues for is we should have universal vouchers. Everybody that needs a place to live should uh, and can't afford it should get a voucher that they can use. And, and of course, that would need to be accompanied by uh, some sort of law that has it as a protected class, because right now there'd be too many landlords say, no, I don't want to take that. Um, uh, he also talks about uh, legal representation that in eviction courts, and he tells the story of this, he lets you feel all that. And, um, uh, you know, 70, 80% of the time a property manager or landlord will have legal representation and about 2% of the time, a poor person being evicted will have legal representation. So uh, one of our community heroes, Scott Holmes, who's a, a professor of law at uh, Central, uh, has takes his class down to eviction court. And they just ask people if they want to help. And just having a legal representative changes. It, it, it gives the judge some alternatives. Uh, things happen uh, because of that. They, they raise legal matters, but also, they work with the with the person being evicted to figure out what they can do, and and argue for that. So those are two things that really um, are make that's making a difference. And Scott is just doing this. There's no plan, He's, and he wants to demonstrate that this is needed and and be able to take that to scale. So let me get back to my PowerPoint here. And so I want to look at this second one, the lack of affordable housing and displacement. Um, it's important to note that, that you know, even before COVID, as I said, we had an affordable housing crisis. There's just not enough units. And the income of, of people in our city, of many of the people in our city, is not enough to afford what is there. Uh, it's good to remember that our poverty rate is 18%. And child poverty rate is even higher at 27%. This is for Durham. Um, these are higher than our state and national averages. In, in Durham, there are 40% of all households in our, in, this is Durham and Chapel Hill, 40% uh, of all households um, in Durham uh, who, who are renting are, are cost burden. Um, oh, I'm sorry. My, I got the I got the stat wrong. 40 percent of households in this Durham Chapel Hill area are renters, and of those renters, forty six percent are cost burden, meaning that they're paying more than thirty percent of their income, so they're housing they're they're housing unstable, and twenty two percent are severely cost burden, meaning they're paying more than fifty percent. So therefore, it's not going to take much of an economic blow. That they're not going to be able to afford the rent. Um, we also have we got to recall in for Durham we're a growing city, and you know if you have a choice between being a declining city or a growing city in terms of economics and and lifestyle, you want to be a growing city. Any mayor wants to be a mayor of a city that's growing <laughs> and thriving, and we have about twenty people a day coming into our uh, to Durham. And so with that, there's gonna be a need for housing. There's also, we can anticipate that there are gonna be some elements of gentrification. By that meaning that the price of housing goes up and, and there's gonna be results of that, of even displacement due to that gentrification. So people who are living in that neighborhood can no longer afford to live there. And we're seeing that in downtown, we're seeing that in many uh, neighborhoods. And of course, it's sort of like, 
there are elements of gentrification, and my students argued back with me about this, um, that, that are positive. <laughs> One, we can't stop it all. We can't. It's, it's market forces and it's more powerful than us. And what are those elements that help uh, get more uh, parks and better streets and more safety and et cetera? We want improvement in our communities, but what we don't want is we don't, need, we don't want that process of improvement uh, displaces people who are living there. So one, one great presentation, uh, and I'd have to, I don't have this link right now, but it was uh, in response to uh, what happened in Bragtown. Uh, there was a group called Horvath uh, TMTLA Associates, and they pro proposed a development in Bragtown across by about 900 new units. Bragtown is just north of me on Roxborough Road as you go north of uh, Interstate 85. Uh, on both the right and left hand sides of the road as you as you're heading north just 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 right beyond the interstate and uh, the community uh, they wanted a zoning change uh, and they needed a zoning change to make this happen uh, the community organized and did an amazing piece of organizing did a a, a presentation uh, at uh, the uh, planning commission uh, uh, disputing the zoning change and asking the, the uh, commissioners there on the planning commission to reject uh, this proposal. Uh, in it, they traced the history of Bragtown to slaves that had first left Stagville uh, uh, off the Cameron pl uh, Plantation. That's just, if you haven't been there, it's 10 miles or so northeast of town. Um, and some of the early, uh, 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 Live, people living in Bragtown were descendants and, and continue to be descendants of those slaves. They also did some study, and I want to tell you a stat they came up with. They, they, they were able to chart in that community that within Bragtown, the number of homes had increased 633 from 2010 to 2018. And they were also able to show that the people who could afford those homes had decreased from 69% to 41%. So the, the, the upshot of that is, the, even over the last eight years, uh, there had been a 14% increase in the number of homes and a 28% decrease in the people who could afford them. I mean, that is, and, and so that, that is almost the definition of gentrification right there. And they argued that this proposed development would increase their housing by 17%, the available housing in Brighttown, and the developers offered 2% of the units to be affordable. And so that, that fact, along with the strength of their presentation, the uh, commissioners voted unanimously no to reject. Uh, and it, it's really, it's sort of a, a, a masterclass in how you do community organizing and how you do a presentation in a public forum. It's really a wonderful. However, it's to be noted, that's a no. They, they organized around a no, we don't want this. That doesn't mean they, they've yet to get to the yes of what they need. Do they want those things that, that a new development would help bring? you know, better, better sidewalks, better roads, better houses, et cetera. Yes, but how do we get that then? How does the investment uh, in Bragtown occur so that some of those positive factors that this developer was proposing actually come to fruition? And that's a much harder uh, place to go to. And then for the last piece, and then I'm gonna pause for a minute. Books said our enduring legacy of racism and uh, I will point you toward a, a online uh, resource called Uneven Ground, and maybe you've seen it. If you haven't, it's worth spending your time just, just clicking through the slides and reading the history uh, uh, of Durham. Uh, and and it's, a, it's, it's a hard history because it's basically a story of us living on land that we stole from others and enslaved people to work it for us as white people. And that's what we, that's, that's a legacy. And what, it's hard for us to grapple with that head on. Uh, and yet until we do, it's going to continue to plague us 
and and certainly in terms of housing policy, there's it's probably the root, one of the root ways that that discrimination and inequity has been practiced and enforced. And in this uh, um, une uneven ground, it really shows in Durham how uh, the black sections of town had uh, less parks and less trees. Uh, and more incinerators to burn uh, garbage and refuse than the, than the white, more affluent areas. It really talks to the kind of uh, tools of discrimination that were everything from deed restrictions to suburban development, um, to zoning laws against multifamily units, to, to um, real estate marketing, to where public housing was placed, to redlining, to practice that uh, uh, banks use to not lend in primary black areas. Uh, and it, it just extends, and, and this, this history, this legacy of discrimination is evident in all elements of housing, uh, housing and housing policy. I mean, just even in, in, within the homeless population in Durham, uh, where we have about 38% of our population is black, among those experiencing homelessness, it's about 76% are black. So it's double the rate, the rate of homelessness among African-Americans is double the rate of the, of the overall population. And it's, it's a, it, and one place that this, this sort of history of this is really documented, and I'm gonna go, I'll stop share here for a minute so I can hold this up. It's this book here called The Color of Law, a Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. And it's written by Richard Rothstein. And it is a detailed account of how it wasn't, his basic argument is this, that we often think that, that prejudice and racism is the result of what he calls de facto. There are people who are prejudiced in our society and they were able to influence things. And his argument is no, it's not in legal terms. It's segregation de jure, Latin term, legal term, meaning by intention. So, uh, and, and it was the intention of the government. So he traces the history starting with really, like I said, during the depression, uh, coming into World War II of how the government, both federal, state and local governments worked to ensure that not only were black populations segregated to where they were living, but they did not have the same advantages and access to wealth building home ownership uh, that the white population has. And it's scathing. I, it is a hard, it's a thick, dense read. And I'll tell you that uh, when I read it, I uh, uh, took it over to my neighbor. Um, and he's, uh, it, well, he's moved now, but he's a uh, retired black minister who grew up in Memphis. And I say, hey, Phil. I want you to read yeah, this book I've read. And, and so I saw him about a week later and handed the book back to me. And he said, uh, I, I said, you read it already? I said, it took me a couple of weeks to get through that thing. And he said, no, he said, I could, I read 40 pages. I couldn't read anymore. He said, you know something? I lived with this stuff all my life. And we knew it was true. We knew it was true that this was purposeful, uh, but it hurts me too much to read it. And I thought, wow, well, I said, well, maybe this book is more for me rather than you, um, for us to understand how we can use our minds, our intellectual minds to grasp and to learn this history uh, of, of, and this enduring legacy that we've come into. Um, and that it's a hurtful history. So this stuff, as we talk about policy, it's not just abstract. These, these are, this is real lives that are impacted by this. Um, so you combine all these things, um, COVID, eviction, affordable housing shortages, systemic racism, and it, it, and it makes us sick, <laughs> you know, it makes us, some of us as individuals sick, it certainly makes us as a community frail and ailing. And we can't really overstate uh, that impact. But where, where do we turn to then? So one of the things that uh, Bree and others, I guess here had, had uh, helped put together is this presentation uh, by Jill Shook, a couple, I guess it was a year, year and a half, two years ago, I forget. 
uh, about her group, uh, Making Housing Happen uh, community, about how uh, as they're working with uh, churches and faith-based institutions to really get involved in affordable housing, they actually become developers of affordable housing. And so it's pretty inspirational to see, and they're really wanting to make an impact uh, to move us from, from, from being sick and ill into healthiness and wholeness. One of the quotes that she used, and uh, uh, Dave you know, alluded to some of the biblical text in, in his uh, opening uh, uh, meditation, was this, uh, she used this uh, slide from Isaiah, your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restore streets with dwellings. And it's just this, that, that housing and housing within the community is part of the hopeful vision that we're being called into. And I think that's was true then for Isaiah and it's true for us here in Durham. I think there's some other ways to, some other lenses. When you see, we can see this issue through faith and the importance and connection that we feel through our faith expression, we can also start to understand housing as a healthcare intervention. Uh, about eight years ago, I had a chance to visit Boston and see the clinic of the woman who's pictured here, uh, Dr. Jesse Gaeta. Uh, she actually went to Carolina and then moved to Boston afterwards. And she just saw so many people who were homeless coming into her clinic uh, who uh, were repeat. You know, they lived on the street. They, they, had more, they were more vulnerable to uh, all the various health uh, conditions, and they just were perpetually, you know, uh, being served in the emergency room. And so her, they actually out of her clinic started a housing program for them and house people. And I find this quote inspiring. Um, it wasn't until I just had a couple of patients housed that I saw this turnaround in their health. Basically, I was seeing that if I could write a prescription for keys to an apartment, that was going to do more to improve the health of the patient sitting in front of me than the prescription I can write for anything else. The prescription is a key to an apartment. And that is, and, and, and I think looking at both this, this issue through the lens of, of faith and connection, but through health and wholeness. Um, let me check my time. Um, so briefly, I will say here that uh, we're looking at the social determinants of health, which is probably a term that you've had. And very quickly, it's that uh, we are most, our health is most impacted by, by that bottom rung, the socioeconomic factors, how much we're paying. Is our house healthy? Are we living in a safe neighborhood? Do I have enough food to eat? That those things have much greater impact than on clinical interventions and, and uh, counseling and education, which is sort of turns a little bit of our healthcare model on its, it flips it. Um, and just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna hang there too long. So I wanna get to a couple of Durham things that are happening um, and, and just hit a couple highlights and I've got a couple slides and then I'm gonna pause and move us into the, our next section, which is your breakout time. So Willard Street is open and operating. It's 82 units of affordable housing. Uh, it's right near the bus station. This was a critical piece, both the uh, Durham CAN and the Coalition for Affordable Housing and Transit were very involved in this advocacy role to make sure this particular piece of land, publicly owned land, owned by the city, was only not only donated uh, for the development of affordable housing, uh, but that the RFP, the request for a proposal, uh, was only, you could only submit to build 82 affordable housing units at below 60 and 30%. Um, back towards your question, Carol, about the housing bond is that we passed in our city a 95 million affordable housing bond. This is also combined with 65 million uh, federal funds that come into us as an entitlement city over the next five years. Uh, and, and the goals there are to build 1,600 new affordable housing units, preserve 800 affordable rental, move 1,700 homeless individuals and households into permanent housing, provide 400 affordable home ownership opportunities for first time home buyers. And of this 95 million, nearly 75 million have been committed to the Durham Housing Authority. And this 
raised a lot of questions about it, a lot of conversation, but I just want to show you a few of the things of what that money is going to and is started to and will continue. So here are three developments that the Durham Housing Authority is doing. They are both new construction as well as redevelopment of existing public housing. So first one right here is Odom. By the way, this is Main Street right here coming right down here. Uh, the new police station is right here on this corner right here. Um, and uh, these are the Liberty Street and Odom Towers uh is is one and this is th these have funding and they've actually uh they've picked developers to work on all three of these projects and i'm going to give you after i tell you where they are uh then i'm going to tell you how many units this is so then the second one here just down at the bottom is called fayette place it's right near the expressway it was originally operated by the housing authority it was sold to a private developer who was going to redevelop it uh it it uh, floundered uh, and set vacant except for some slabs uh, that were in and some stoops that were constructed. It's right beside the expressway. Uh, the community lobbied to make sure this land uh, was obtained. The housing authority had a right of uh, to buy it back if they did if the private company didn't develop it for four million dollars and through advocacy, four million dollars of our taxpayer dollars were appropriated so that housing third authority could buy it and now they've have on, on the timetable to develop it and then a third one over here that's jj henderson tower and forest hills both of which are existing public housing uh and so when you look at all those together uh it uh, it also includes the the uh, housing authority offices i should say is they add up to a total of 1700 units 100 I mean, a thousand new units and the remainder are a mix of public housing and some market rate housing. And that's sort of the new model that's being used. In addition, this is also going on. These are public interventions. Uh, Durham County was lobbied uh, by much of the same advocates that I've just named uh, to develop their publicly owned land. Again, the key, you can call the shots on what you what, what is owned by the government. Uh, if, the, if the commissioners and city council agree. In this case, the county commissioners, the county had not been investing in, uh, in affordable housing. They had seen their work primarily in health and human service field, uh, but because of the need and because of the advocacy, they responded. And these are two, right now they're flat, two flat surface parking lots. This is Main Street coming down here. Uh, this is the library over to the top left. Uh, and this is being developed into a combination of affordable housing, parking, market rate units, a child care center, tenant and commercial park, uh, parking on, on both lots. So this is a massive, these, and this one has started, you can see it now uh, in downtown Durham, if you haven't already, this is slated to start, I think next year or the following year, this site too. Uh, this is the Durham Human Services, Health and Human Services building right here. So these are some public, initiatives. And it leads us to, to this last part, um, which is what about private initiatives? What, what might congregations such as uh, the Durham Congregation and Duke, how might one be involved to support the development of affordable housing? And the, and the first thing I wrote here is to be a presence in the suffering world. We, we are, we, we are, people that have been redeemed and we are people that are set free and we're forgiven and whole. I had a, a mentor, Will Campbell, and his, uh, and his buddy who was my professor at Brea College, who at, once they got through kind of stripping us uh, in my youth of our religious pretensions, uh, people would often ask, well, what do you want us to do? And they would say nothing. I want you to do nothing. I want you to be. And they would use the Greek word, katalagate, I want you to be reconciled. And that what our world needs is people who are present, who know their identity and know their connection with people. Uh, be who we are, be a presence in the suffering world. And I can't overstate that, that, that this work is not just of the head. This is work of the heart, the hospitality uh, uh, of our connection to others. And, I, and, and again, I'm guided by that, and I hope you may be. Uh, 
support advocacy efforts. Uh, CAN, I've mentioned, the coalition I've mentioned, People's Alliance and Durham Committee on the Affairs of Black People both have uh, active housing committees. You can contribute land or support banking. There are a number of churches around the area who have already are exploring using their land that they have for uh, affordable housing or to engage Duke, uh, both the Office of uh, Durham Community Affairs and Duke Medical Center to think about is there Duke land that could be used in the same way that our public land has been done and to invest in this uh, understanding of housing as healthcare and, and, and really put in the practice this understanding of the social determinants of health, that the quality of housing and your community is a, is a, is a deeper, far, a far more far-reaching indicator of community's health. You can speak about affordable housing from pulpit, conduct Sunday school classes, and see this as I think you already do as an equity and justice issue. And the last thing I'll mention is align with neighborhood groups where you live to promote affordable housing development in your neighborhood. I will say that, that uh, Housing for New Hope, when I was there, we, we did a development out on Coal Mill Road. There was affordable housing and never had, had affordable housing. It was with an abandoned building. So the community kind of liked to see something done with that, 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 that building. And the city loved putting money there because for the first time, somebody was doing some affordable housing in basically a middle-class neighborhood. And so we need that. I mean, you know, we need uplift of the poorer communities, but also it needs to be a distribution of, of where affordable housing is placed. And some of that is dealing with the stigma of who lives there. So I've said a lot, I'm gonna stop. I'm gonna ask Bree if she will uh, put us into groups uh, and you're gonna be in a group according to these sort of, one, two, three, four, five, six. And just, you'll have about uh, almost 10 minutes, about eight minutes uh, to discuss and then we'll come back together and process a little bit of that, all right? Uh, Bree, are we are we good to kind of do? We, I know you need a few minutes here. To... We, we're we're good. I think we're back, Jerry. Okay, I want to welcome you back and and uh, request that if Bree will once again uh, whiteboard some of our responses. And so I'd like to go around and hear from the different groups and, and a, a perf, an acceptable uh, answer response from your group is, we don't think we should do this <laughs> or we don't think this will help. That's quite all right. These are, these are only suggested directions. You all know your congregation, you know what you've done before, you know where energy is. And so this is just to see if there are some uh, synergy around uh, housing and affordable housing issues and, and ways to undertake them. So uh, I guess the best way is to maybe just go down uh, from group one and, and hear some comments from each one. Uh, so I invite group one to unmute and um, share a, a few of the things that they said or were said in their group. Kate, you go first. <laughs> um, I think uh, one one big part is the grounding in the spiritual life is is important, and it's an important place to start from um, before any um, kind of focused effort in, um, in in our work in the world can take place. Um, I guess we, we also talked about how you can perhaps stay there and not go out and do the work. Um, that's, that's one thing that can happen. Um, yeah, I guess I'll leave it at that, Robin. You take over. Yeah, Kate, Kate and I uh, had a good, we had the teacher in the room. So first of all, that was super awkward, but then, then Kate and I made good friends and um, I would add to her comments just one, and that is she used a particular word, which I found really evocative, which was expression. The idea of expressing our, our um, commitment, our alliance, our allegiance to the issue at hand. In this case, it would be homelessness. Um, and, and that expression is 
and I, she, she, she lamented that expression sometimes is the sum all of what happens and that people don't go to the next step of action, that they stay in that place of expression. I argued that equally difficult is when the work is being done, but it is not cohesively expressed so as to give an identity to the work, right? And a, and a, prior, a sense of priority to the work. So, so it was a great conversation. Thank you, Terry and Kate. Thank you. All right, thank you all both for weighing in. Group two, support the advocacy efforts of which I named some in there and you may have come up with some others. So group two, uh, let us know a few of the things that you all discussed. Go ahead, Terry. Terry's on mute. Okay, Carl. <laughs> um, what, you know, we were all, we all felt ourselves um, to different degrees lacking in knowing of the different options available. And uh, that was an important reason for being here and for doing further research. I think that we were all interested in, uh, in finding out and then supporting what actually works of the different uh, options and, and opportunities, what has been tried before. It, we, could, we can always just do something and say, well, we did something and then walk away from it. But what is really going to work? Where, where should the efforts, the money, the political persuasion, et cetera, et cetera, what, what do we know works? And if we don't know that, what are, is the best uh, options for a, a real successful change and solution? Thank you, Carl. Uh, Terry, they, you got volunteered. Uh, would you like to add to that? I got volunteered. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. I had to you go for a bathroom break, so I missed that. Um, I, I just said that um, the church that I belong to is a member of Durham Can, mm -hmm. and um, I've gone to a couple events with Durham Can, but because I don't really live in Durham, I haven't been more involved. But for me, it's a learning opportunity to find out what is going on, how I can help, how I can be informed for voting, because to me, voting is a huge uh, deal to know who you're voting for and what you're voting for. Thank you. And if I could just dovetail into that, um, a great way to support advocacy um, efforts is to be an informed voter. Good linkage, thank you. All right, group three, contribute land or support land banking. Uh, uh, one great group uh, that does that is Durham Community Land Trust and also to engage uh, Duke uh, Office of Durham Community Affairs and Duke Medical Center. And I can tell you contacts within there if you need them, but to look at does Duke have land uh, that they could do as much the city and county has, or is there ways for medical center to more directly invest in housing as healthcare? So group three, what'd y'all come up with? It was mostly an educational time because Bree knew about uh, the West End uh, Durham Community Land Trust, and uh -huh. and uh, we talked a little about how uh, Habitat and Self Help Credit Union and so on are in, involved with that process. Um, that probably is going to stay in the hands of the, the people who, who govern the trust. You know, they're not quite as malleable maybe as, as uh, you know, appearing at a, at a hearing from, for city planning or the, uh, the zoning commission type of thing. And I, 
so back to group two, you know, there's meetings all the time and, and which meetings are, are crucial to attend and, and maybe speak at or, or whatever beyond just at, at uh, election time. Mm-hmm. Um, it would be, it's, it's hard to know where to put your time and, and attention. There's so much going on with feel very much outside the, the governing process. Yeah. Thank you, Dave. Anyone else from that group want to add to that? I appreciated Brianna's contribution in educating me because I did not know about the land trust. I did not know about the self-help credit union, uh, different things that she was able to inform us okay. about. And it was and, and how it's continuing and, and trying to grow in West End and all that was very helpful for me to learn. Thank you, Brianna, working all the all the angles. We appreciate you. Yes, she is. Let's, let's go on to group four. Speak about affordable housing from pulpit, conduct Sunday school classes, et cetera, and understand this. And I think you all probably already do as an equity and justice issue. Any comments from group four? Yeah, so I really uh, appreciate our conversation centered around identifying the call within the congregation um, and how each congregation has different um, gifts and skills and resources to come around this issue in different ways. And so that may mean uh, finding ways to include it in sermons or Sunday school classes or partnering with organizations surrounding them. Um, and we had a lot of conversation around like the difference between reinventing the wheel by trying to start your own thing or partnering with groups already doing the work and definitely lean towards the need for um, congregations to partner. Um, and then also just the fact that we should be incorporating these things within our church's vision and mission as it's inherent within the gospel message, um, be that explicitly identifying um, the housing crisis, um, or um, maybe not explicitly saying it, but speaking on the different justice and equity aspects within it in our day-to-day -day, um, mission and vision of the church. Very good, Leslie. Thank you. Anyone else from that group have anything to add to uh, Leslie's? She summarized well. Okay. Thank you, Carol. Group five, Align with neighborhood groups where you live to promote affordable housing development in your neighborhood. What about group five? Where, these questions get a little bit harder as we go along, you may have noticed. <laughs> Anybody from group five that y'all uh, say we can't do this or do you have some ideas or where'd you go? Okay. No, it's not me. Okay. Well, while we're thinking, is there a six? Is there a group six? I forget. Is that it? Three. When well, there are group six? I think there were just five. Okay. All right. Is group five one of my in? Okay. Well, we're right at uh, 12 o'clock. And let me finish, stop screen. Oh, let's see here. I think that is something that you all uh, can revisit and work with, lift up and see what you'll do with. And Bree, I'd love you to share both of those documents with me as well and share the PowerPoint. In closing, I, I think I just want to take you back to this moment uh, because it was uh, highlighted in my small group this moment of me standing with my next door neighbor and him saying, I can't read this. I can't read anymore. It hurts too much. And, and um, Kate used some language that I think is helpful because there was an important exchange there that's differentiation first, that Phil's experience is not the same as my experience, right? Uh, and it was important for me to just be present in that moment with him, to hear how painful that had been. And that's, that's my role in that. And, it, and it's up to me then to continue to figure out how these insights that come from this, how it can inform others. 
So, so I do. So I, I, I bring it to your attention. I bring it to the students in the public policy class. I have attention. I use my mind. So this, this, this issue of, uh, and many issues are like this, it is both head analysis, data, um, advocacy. These are the tools that acknowledge differentiation. And it's also heart because within that is where we are connected with each other. It's, it's not that we're not the same, but there's unity. And both of these things have to do then with, they, they bring together this world of reflection, identity with action and change. And so I wanna leave you with that thought and at this point, pass it on uh, to whoever uh, goes next. And great to have this chance to interact with y'all. And I'm staying here till it's over, but I'm done. Yeah, Terry, thank you so much for um, your time and your expertise. You've given us much, much food for thought. Um, and there, you, you didn't see it, but there were questions in the chat of, I got to oh. save this stuff. I got to save this. Um, uh, I'm, I, I need I need to review this to digest it. So thank you, Terry, for um, prompting our thinking um, and encouraging our spirit to reach out to those in need. Thank you. So um, I'm also grateful to Bree and Community Ministry and for the Education Committee at the Congregation for sponsoring this and for volunteers who helped make it possible. So thank you all and thank you all for participating. I appreciate the gift of your time. There's always choices on how to spend your time. So I'm grateful for your choice to spend time with us today. I'm gonna to put two links in the chat. Um, one is a very short evaluation that just helps the education committee plan. It's only six, six questions. So if you would click on that link and then save it until after you close the Zoom, that would be terrific. Um, I'll also, a little bit of self-promotion, um, I'm going to put in the how to sign up for the congregation's newsletter for future events. If you don't get that, you're welcome to that. I'd also like you to know that um, Robin Barefoot is going to offer our closing devotions. And after that, the Zoom room will stay open for a little while. So stay in chat, um, ask Terry a few last minute questions if you wish. Um, but you don't have to run off. Um, if we were physically present with one another, we would linger and chat for a moment. So that is an invitation to do that. So again, thank you, Terry. And I turn it over now to Robin, who will um, give us a closing uh, devotional thought. Thank you, Carol. And yes, this has been exceptional, Terry. So thanks to all the planners and the executors. Um, David Voss and I didn't talk in advance of this, and so it's fascinating to me that the Spirit has led both of us to kind of bookend this presentation, which is highly intellectual and data and policy driven with matters of the heart. David spoke about judgment, and, and I, I was prompted when Carol asked me to lead a devotion, I was prompted to remember a book I had read once, which is called The Fear of Beggars, and it's written by a Duke Divinity alumni. It's about 10 or so years old, and, and, it, and it kind of prompted me to think about how also we approach the homeless um, when, we, when we come face to face. So I'm going to read a little bit. Dave did his... Uh, off, off his lovely head, um, but I'm, I'm gonna read a little bit. Um, so um, it seems to me, and the work of this scholar, her name is Kelly Johnson, um, it seems to her and her work would ground us in the idea that our inquiry today and our discussion about solutions to homelessness lies in the, lies the pilgrimage that we are all on, um, that underneath this discussion is our pilgrimage. Um, each of our lives and our collective life as a Christian community is a pilgrimage characterized by movement toward and participation in the mutual love of the Trinity. It's movement towards that mutual love because as yet the community has not come to the vision of God and it's participation in that mutual love because through the power of the spirit, this community has already received the love's gift. The one who is the way walks with us. 
And those we call homeless raise questions about our society, about the nature and limits of property rights, about the material meaning of dignity, the working of justice among strangers. The homeless of our cities disrupt us and often our reaction comes from a place of fear. Um, we fear for our safety, we fear conflict, we fear our own financial well-being, we fear being duped or being taken advantage of or that our gestures may only make things worse. When Jesus foretold that we will always have the poor among us, I think he may have meant that fostering justice will never be a static solution. We have no lasting city here. Justice will instead be built with ongoing negotiation, the ongoing daily meeting of humans and human needs, and as a means of grace to confront and escape our own fears. Um, face to face with the homeless, feeling the adrenaline rush that may be spurred by our fear, um, interrupted from our routine and looking straight into the failure of our economic systems, we are wise to remember that Jesus stands among those who have no choice but to live outside. He stands with those who wait with an open hand or with a handwritten sign. People who are hungry, thirsty, mentally ill, recently unemployed, disabled, veteran, child, or childless. When we are face to face with the homeless, we can choose not to look away. We can recognize kinship. We can cultivate practices of conversation and encounter. We can be open to kindness and caring. We can provide creatively from within our means. We can interrogate our privilege and the social order. And most importantly, we can pray. So if you'll pray with me now, Oh Lord, we pray for every man, woman, and child in our city who has no place to call home. We pray that they be connected to resources for meeting the most basic and essential needs, access to shelter, adequate food, and health care. We pray that you remove the structural, physical, emotional, or mental barriers they face to finding stable housing and employment. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be present and active within our congregation and all others who minister to and advocate on behalf of the homeless. Lead us into deep knowing that our generosity to the homeless, poor and hungry is our generosity to you, O oh Lord. We pray for those gathered here today and especially for Terry Alabaugh who led our collective learning. Transfigure us, God. Make us radiant with the freedom to choose love use our willing hearts to rebuild relationships as well as social structures so that our neighbors do not, do not lack the dignity and grounding of home. We ask all these things in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Thank you, Robin. Again, thank you all for coming and stay and visit as long as you wish. <laughs>